Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's eminent persons lecture by Dr. Amit Gupta, who is an associate professor at the Department of International Security Studies at the United States Air Force Air War College in Alabama, United States, States of America. Dr. Gupta, who has been associated with the UA, uh, USAF War College since 2005, is a renowned expert within the academic as well as the strategic community. Some of his major research and advisory work are under the themes such as globalization, US-China rivalry, demography and security, international security, and peace research, and etc. His biodata, which is available to all of you, illustrates his exceptional academic and professional record. Though uh, through his research, he has extensively contributed and uh, continues to contribute to the global strategic and academic discourse by his several books, monographs, articles, in renowned journals, magazines, and newspapers, his reports for supranational bodies, and of course, conference, conference symposiums, symposium. workshops, and seminars. For his exceptional work, he has received several academic fellowships, awards, and administrative positions. I encourage you to read his biodata if you haven't already done so. It is such a great honor for the National Maritime Foundation to have him deliver a lecture. At this moment, I would like to accord a special welcome to our chairman, Admiral Sunil Lamba, who has joined us today. It is always a privilege to have him, uh, to have his distinguished presence amongst us. We will hear his view in the end segment of today's program or at any moment which he would feel uh, deemed appropriate. And ladies and gentlemen, would uh, uh, permit me to quickly state uh, a couple of important admin instructions which we request you to follow for the smooth conduct of today's program. The number one is that all the participants, except the speakers, are requested to mute their mics and switch off their device camera. This will ensure that we have the maximum bandwidth available to us. And uh, the second or the last instruction is that any question that you might have can be posted in the chat box and they will be addressed during the interactive session, which would be conducted in the second half of the program. Uh, which would be moderated by Admiral Chauhan himself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we, uh, we move forward, uh, we'll do a small ritual. May I now request uh, all of you to kindly switch on your cameras for 30 seconds or so to allow us the luxury of taking a good photograph of all the participants. And uh, as you switch on your cameras, please ensure to have a good smile so that we can have a better picture. Hi Satyam, uh, Dr. Gupta will have to stop sharing the screen. Oh, uh, sorry. Screen. Okay. Uh, share. Oh, stop sharing. Got it. Ladies and gentlemen, may I once again request you to uh, kindly show cameras. Uh, oh. Do you see uh, Dr. Gupta? Hey, I hit stop sharing. So. You know how it is. Uh, it still even, comes even, on. Even the computer doesn't want to let go of you. <laughs> well, that's terrible. <laughs> so, you know what I'll do? Let me do one thing. Get back to my screen here. Hit ask. Oh, it's still my hit stop sharing. Don't I'm, worry, we'll take a set of. Uh, oh, it's fine. Just take your layout, uh, Satyam. So. No, don't do that. Dr. Gupta, uh, we are managing the screenshot at, at our end by changing the layout. So you need not okay. change, uh, or you need, right. need not stop I the will. presentation, sir. So maybe we'll uh, just uh, please allow us another 15 to 20 seconds because we want uh, to take all the pictures that are available to us. And that would be it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for switching on the camera and uh, posing for the photograph. And now, without any further ado, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation, to deliver his opening remarks. Admiral Chauhan, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Satyam. And uh, let me reiterate the Foundation's very warm welcome to Dr. Amit Gupta, who is uh, actually coming to the NMF and going to talk to us, I think, for the first time. So it is quite a singular privilege for the Foundation. Clearly, we've done something right. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it is quite a distinct uh, honor. Now, there are a few things I would like to say before um, prefacing the uh, topic as such, and that is that Dr. Gupta and I have had the privilege of, uh, at least I have had the privilege of listening to him on a few occasions when he brought the uh, Air Force uh, uh, College down, and if you could uh, please mute your mic. What, yaar? Uh, thank you. Uh, so what I was saying was that uh, we have had uh, occasion, I've had occasion to listen to him when he's brought the um, student officers of the UN United States uh, Air Force War College down to New Delhi. And uh, we have had uh, the privilege of listening to some fairly provocative uh, comments. And uh, that is what really endeared me uh, endeared him to me uh, because I thought that, you know, uh, provocative comments that elicit responses, whether those responses are outraged ones or they are uh, ones which are in, 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 in uh, quasi agreement are indeed the stuff of which uh, uh, intellectual conversations and conferences ought to be wrapped around. I hope and I'm sure <laughs> that uh, uh, Amit will not disappoint us this time either. Uh, now coming to the Quad and this whole India-US Quad mechanism. May I once yeah, again request everybody to please mute your mic because you're getting a lot of uh, echo. Amit, uh, perhaps uh, I could request you two to mute your mic. Yeah, you. I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. Sorry. Good. Great. Sorry for uh, uh, that, but those are the limitations of technology and uh, lack of adequate bandwidth. So we in uh, the world are moving ahead uh, actually of the point at which technology promised. And that is a good theme at which for me to start. This promise of technology, uh, it ought not to be taken to such a esoteric level that it ends up betraying one's approach to uh, geopolitics and the factors that contribute to geopolitics most definitely are geoeconomics. And then every nation has strategies in which to attain those particular geoeconomic objectives and some non-geoeconomic ones such as prestige and you know the, the, the desire to be number one and so on and so forth. So I think that um, also there is a marked tendency to extrapolate from one um, scenario across to another scenario. And this is particularly so uh, when we look at the Indo-Pacific in which the range of countries and their independent and collective capabilities are actually quite a complex mix. They're quite disparate in some cases. The economies are radically different. The approaches that they follow in terms of their geopolitics are therefore different. And if there was only to be one school of uh, geopolitics, then uh, I'm afraid all those gentlemen and ladies who study international relations would have a set of lean pickings in their universities. So yes, there are different approaches within the Indo-Pacific. Now, India. Uh, in particular in dealing with the United States of America, we feel that at least we in the NMF feel, because you know there are 1.4 billion Indians and there, therefore there are 1.4 billion Indian perspectives. But uh, we in the NMF, I dare say, uh, we believe that we are not frightened of the uh, disparate nature of the, the uh, Indo-Pacific and it's in all its ramifications. So we feel that this, there are a series of warp, you know, in, in, a, in a tapestry that are warp threads and there are weft threads. 
And we think that the while the WEFs are perhaps constantly with the United States of America and possibly now between the United States and the, of America and China, but the warp threads are definitely much more luxuriant in nature. And this creates, in fact, a, a tapestry. And the more, the more different colors we have in it, the better it is. There are not only one solution to it, to the whole region's problems, whether that one comes from the United States or that one comes from China or that one comes from Russia or anywhere else. The ability of every country and most certainly India to take the maximum out of each of these offerings and offer uh, such offerings of its own as will create win-win situations is beyond doubt. So this is not something that is contested. Even when we interact with Australia, with Japan, with the United States, or with Russia, or with, and I'm trying hard not to bracket my conversation solely to um, the, the limits of Quad, because I think that India can go beyond Quad and keep flitting in and out and utilizing the Quad for its strengths and dumping the Quad where it has obvious weaknesses. Uh, we, we will do what is best in the long-term interest of India. We will try to ensure that our long-term interests are liberal enough to be able to accommodate the long-term interests of other powers to the maximum degree possible. We cannot have an Indian, an Indo-Pacific where there are no rules. That much is intuitively obvious. So a rules-based order is definite. Where ought these rules to be made? Should they be made by consensus? Should they be made arbitrarily in a given uh, capital? Does that mean that we have to keep going backwards into history and saying, falling into the fallacy of the two quaker, that means you also did it, approach, and saying that, you know, in the past they were done in this manner, therefore, how far can we take that argument? How far should we take that argument? Where we come to hard power, which is what this talk is really going to be uh, focused upon, and the correlation between hard power and geoeconomics, and therefore between hard power, geoeconomics, and geopolitics, I think that uh, there is very large amount that we can and must have uh, to offer as well as to receive. I am actually sick of an India which projects itself or is projected as sitting cross legged on some appropriate highway with a PL480 kind of bowl saying, put something in it. I am not in favor. Uh, I'm quite willing to defend my position, but I'm not in favor of an India which is forever a supplicant. India has large strengths, and we must be able to leverage those strengths. China has large strategic weaknesses and we must be able to leverage them where it is necessary to leverage them. To listen to, to, to stitch this all together, this domain principally being predominantly a maritime domain, which can be exploited only by two uh, elemental forces, which are of hard power, namely air forces and the Navy, not necessarily in that order, of course. They need to be discussed, their interfaces need to be discussed. How much interoperability ought we to have? What is interoperability? Does interoperability have non-technical connotations? Are aircraft carriers already doomed? Or can ships survive without aircraft carriers? Maybe they can, in which case we, we should look at that. The f how much should we extrapolate the the Bosnian uh, sort of situation vis-a-vis -vis drones across to different regions, how much? And will we be caught in the trap of knee-jerk reactions to everything that is happening? For example, if you take terror, should we be terrified of the fact that tomorrow we may have sarin gas attacks because at some stage, some country had that particular experience? Should we lock up all our kindergarten schools because in some other country, people open fire. In other words, what will work for us? 
needs to be understood. And for that, we could not have had a more uh, eloquent and more erudite speaker, I think, uh, than Dr. Amit Gupta. So I will now stop because you haven't come to hear me at all, and we have all come to hear Dr. Gupta. So I'll stop with all these sorts of dangling uh, questions and dangling points and hope that he will pick up a few of them and uh, run with that particular set of uh, balls at different points in his talk. So uh, thank you once again, and I would like to say thank you right at the outset to our very distinguished online uh, audience. Uh, many of them are already, I'm sure, furiously putting down something or the other uh, to ask us and to challenge us. Uh, and, but thank you very much for sparing your time and your effort this evening. It's evening for us. It's morning for Dr. Gupta. So it's a good time for all of us to embark upon this. Without further ado, uh, Dr. Amit Gupta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vice Admiral Chauhan. And this is a genuine honor that you've given me this chance to come and talk to you. I want to preface my remarks with two things. First, I met Vice Admiral Chauhan when he was Captain Chauhan of the INS Virat. We brought our students to the ship and the Navy, of course, puts on the best show anybody can put on. And he talked to us about for 15 minutes on how the Navy could be used to carry out coercion against Pakistan without crossing the nuclear threshold. And I was busy at the back taking notes and saying, I'm so glad to see that the Navy is thinking uh, in 21st century terms of dealing with a challenge. So I've been a long term fan of his. The second thing is, and I, I want to be very explicit about this. My, the last time I came to India was 2019. I came three times. The first time was the day Abhinandan was shot down. And three days later, I went to give a lecture at the College of Air Warfare in Hyderabad. And my sister, who's normally the most polite human being I know, said, Amit, we are very touchy right now. Do not go to Hyderabad and give them gyan. They will not be happy. So similarly, today I'm not here to give you gyan. What I want to do is have a discussion, and I would be interested in hearing your um, views so that we can have some kind of dialogue and hopefully we both learn from it. All right, what I'm going to do today is really address some of the issues that Vice Admiral Chauhan raised in his uh, introductory um, remarks. And I'm not going to talk about SISMOA and DDTI and all this stuff because it's boring, it's meant for South Block. I'm going to talk about grand strategy. And in grand strategy, the issue is how do you bring together all of India's elements of power to address the emerging challenges. And oh, is this? There we go. And as I see it, we've got four challenges going in the Indian context. First is the fragility of the Quad. The second is, of course, the China challenge. The third is like any serious democracy. India has this constant struggle between guns versus butter. And finally, the one thing we don't talk about, but which I think both civilian agencies and militaries need to talk about is what happens in the post COVID world, because there are going to be a different kind of pressure on governments uh, that are democratic. All right, let me go to this first slide here. I'm a quad skeptic and by a quad skeptic, I have little hope in the present context for the Quad as a military unit. And let me explain why. Number one, the Americans, the Japanese, and the Australians have interoperability, both in terms of technology and communications. They all have Aegis class destroyers. They're all flying the same planes. They use the same communication systems. So you could take an Australian officer and put him on a Japanese ship. You could take a Japanese officer and put him on an American ship. They would be comfortable. India doesn't fall into that degree of interoperability. It's about a generation to generation and a half behind in terms of communications. And the majority of the hardware is incompatible. 
We saw this with the last time the Indian Air Force showed up at red flag. It couldn't talk to the other air forces which were participating in the exercise. So it's not that the Indian Air Force was bad. It's not that the Indian Air Force had bad airplanes. To the contrary, the problem was if you're trying to do a joint operation, you've got to be able to talk to each other. The second thing which makes me a quad skeptic is quite frankly, I don't think the Australians or the Japanese are going to be this great warrior nations vis-a-vis -vis China. And I'll show you a bit on China, uh, Australia in a minute, but I've spent the last seven years or so in New Delhi, Tokyo, Canberra, talking to people about the Quad. And I asked the Australian Deputy Chief of the Air Force twice, would you go to the South China Sea? And his answer in both cases was no, our area of operations, our area of responsibility ends at the southern shores of Indonesia, Malaysia. So for them to go that far in would be rattling the cage of the panda. And believe me, they're not interested in doing that. The other thing is Japan's demographic disaster. Uh, I always laugh when I see Japanese talk about getting aggressive with the Chinese because look at the data I've put up there. Their population goes from 126 million to 107 million. Their median age goes from 46.5 to 53.3. And as I've told my Japanese students, you are the last samurai because what's going to happen in another 10 years is your young population will have shrunk so much your military choices get reduced. Now, a little bit about the Australians, because in 2019, when I was in Delhi, I kept hearing about the Australian option. And since I study Australia, I have some idea what they can do and what they can't do. And here's what you have to remember. Since 2010, Australia has had a huge economic boom. That boom, there's a one word, reason for that, and that is China. And I'll just give you an idea. The Australians and the Chinese now have $170 billion of bilateral trade, Australian dollars. And essentially, the Australians sell commodities, iron ore, natural gas, coal, to the Chinese. And that's what sparked the boom in the economy. Uh, the Australians have $43 billion in tourist dollars, $12 billion of that, which is over a fourth of it, comes from China. 12 billion in agricultural products go to China. And in terms of international students, the Australians have half a million, which is quite good compared to the United States, which has a million, but whose population is, you know, much larger than that of the Australians. But 29% of all Australian foreign students come from China. This is a very high level of economic interdependency. And the Australians recognize this. They've tried to come up with ideas like, we'll go talk to the Indians, we'll raise trade with India to 45 billion. That's on the wish list. It's nowhere near that. In the meantime, despite all the tension between Beijing and Canberra, Australia-China trade in the last year went from 160 to $160 billion. They have a huge economic dependency on China. They are a or they're going to be a member of RCEP. They understand where their economic bread is buttered. And that is why, while they may talk about Quad, they also say, very much like what Vice Admiral Chauhan said, we have to keep our national economic interests in mind. Now, the second thing is the China challenge. And, you know, I do not believe in dismissing China there are a whole bunch of people around the world who don't know how to deal with China. So they go with what I call the Cristiano Ronaldo approach. And that is, you know, when you're going to play Cristiano Ronaldo, oh, let me go and put this in Indian terms. You're playing India and you're batting, uh, Sachin Tendulkar is batting. You know, you can't stop Sachin Tendulkar. So what you do and what you hope is that Sachin Tendulkar will fall sick that day. The actual fact is Sachin Tendulkar doesn't fall sick. And I talk Sachin Tendulkar because he was a great batsman, Virat Kohli, what can I say? Anyway, the point is this, 
We have been talking for the last 25 years that China will fall sick, China will fail, it doesn't. And if you look at these numbers from 2020, and this is from the European Directorate of Trade, their biggest, their largest trading partner now is ASEAN at $724 billion, then comes the EU at $645 billion, then comes the United States, and then comes Japan at $330 billion. You can look at that list. Everybody on that list is an American ally. What the Chinese have done is they have given every country around the world the choice of be with the Americans or make money with the Chinese. And they're not saying break away from the Americans. They're saying make money with us. But the implicit thinking is if you make money with us, it weakens your commitment to an American alliance. And these are the people who hold American treasury securities. And as you can see, Japan is the highest, but China second. China used to be number one till 2019. Then when the tensions started, they started reducing the amount of money they had in America. The Chinese have done one more thing in the United States, which people don't talk about. They are buying up small businesses, property, so on around the United States in cities nobody had thought of. And the idea of being you get access to American markets, American technology. This is not the Cold War. This is a very different kind of tension between the US and China than the one between the United States and Russia. This is one where both countries depend on each other economically. At the same time, there are serious military strategic issues. And when you look at those numbers, what I, I want you to keep in mind is, as Indians, look at where the rest of the world stands and look at where India stands. If you go down the list on Treasury bill holders, Luxembourg comes in at one, two, three, four, five. Luxembourg has a population of half a million people, which makes it one fortieth the size of the national capital region of Delhi. Belgium has 236 billion. That may, and Belgium's half the size of the national capital region of Delhi. If you have to compete internationally, you have to have a global economic presence. And that to me is the biggest challenge for India, far more than whatever China may be doing on the border. Now, how then do you go with a workable quad? And Admiral Chauhan and I were discussing this in Kathmandu on a Zoom meeting a month ago. And here's what I think. Instead of talking interoperability, we're all going to have aircraft carriers, uh, INS Arihant will be in the South China Sea, none of that's going to happen. What I think is India can play a crucial role in the Quad because India has two things. It has population. It has educated population, which in many cases tend to be different. And here's what you can do. There's 1.4 billion Indians. The Chinese are trying desperately to control 5G around the world. And as Vladimir Putin points out, he who controls 5G will control the future global economy. 1.4 billion Indians. Any country that gets the Indian 5G contract now has global presence. And that country will be able to provide an alternative to China's 5G, China's technological domination, so on. And I think the Indian government should be talking very seriously about this. The second thing is a concerted vaccine strategy. And I've said this before, India was doing really well till March. Remember, 60 million vaccines were distributed around the world as part of Vaccine Maitri. And I think I'm, that that is quite impressive. It was more than what the US did or China did, or for that matter, Russia did. And I think this is where the Australians and the Japanese need to put their money where their mouth is and say, how do we help India ramp up vaccine production? Because it's very clear that we're going to need 16 billion vaccines, plus increasingly, the talk in America is about a third booster vaccine. So. We're going to need 24 billion vaccines around the world. There's very few countries that can supply that kind of vaccinations. India is one of them. And 
think of the global contribution India makes. And, you know, you're right. India is not the half naked fakir sitting on a highway saying, please give me PL 480. It's a lot more than that. But play to the strengths of India is what I would say. Uh, the Quad perspective on sovereignty, I don't need to discuss. I'm a big fan of a Quad educational policy. Japan, Australia, and the United States have world-class universities. Um, the Australians have, I think, 29 universities in the top 500 universities. The US has 134. The, ja the Chinese have 53. It's time to leverage that educational capacity to spread it across Asia and the rest of the world to give people more hope. And some of you have done these massive online organized courses which American universities offer. How do we expand this kind of educational capacity? How do we give more hope and future to people across the world? And the last thing is I think we need a quad policy of cybersecurity. Given what the Chinese, their friendly little brothers, the North Koreans, um, the Russians do around the world, which is cyber hacking, both into military, commercial facilities. And, you know, the Indian Foreign Service knows this for a fact that the Chinese turned on the cameras in all the Indian embassies around the world on the computers. This is an issue. Get the four countries together, have a common approach, have a sharing of ideas, have a sharing of technologies, and then bring in like-minded countries across the world into a quad cybersecurity policy. That's the quad and the Chinese challenge. Let me get to the guns versus butter dilemma. And this is, there's two parts to this. One is India is a remarkably young country. Every time I travel on the metro in Delhi, uh, there's always some young man or young woman who stands up and says, uncle, please sit. And I just get furious because I'm like, oh my God, do I look that old now? But the thing is, these are young and quite frankly, well-mannered children. We are a, or India is a young country. You need to be investing in the things that give the young a future. Social welfare programs, education programs. And if that's the case, how do you put more money into defense? And if you look at it, since the first Manmohan Singh government, the Indian government has not been a big spender on defense. It's been spending anywhere between 1.6 to 1.8% uh, of GDP. The old planning commission used to say spend 3% of GDP. So India is well below where it could be in terms of uh, defense expenditure. And I don't think there is a government in India short of a major war, which is going to go back to 3%. And 3% is a huge amount because we're now talking the Indian economy in 2021. We're not talking the Indian economy in 1961. 50 years makes a lot of difference, or 60 years makes a lot of difference. The second thing to keep in mind is that the days of subsidized weaponry are over. Uh, there's only three countries that I can think of, or four, where people are still getting subsidized weapons. The United States gives grant aid to the Israelis. Uh, China, of course, helps out North Korea uh, and Pakistan. Iran has been giving subsidized help to the Hezbollah and the Houthis. And I'll add one more. The Pakistanis have been helping the Taliban. So if you take these away, arms acquisition now is a commercial venture. Nobody's giving you subsidized arms the way they did during the Cold War. And let's face facts, anything you buy today on the international arms market is hugely expensive. Now, add to this the complication, which is India's defense acquisition strategy. And I've written a lot on this. I've got a new article coming out in comparative strategy in January next year. But here's the problem. You now face a two front threat. That is, I mean, I don't even need to go into that with you, but what is the problem with Indian? weapons acquisition and production process. And since the prime minister is a Gujarati, I will put this in Gujarati terms. There is an expression that Gujarati merchants, Vanias use, called Songu Sastu Udhar Namtu. And that sums up Indian arms production policy. Songu is oh, arms acquisition and production. Songu is, it must be of good quality. Sastu is when you sell to me, it must be cheap. 
Udhar is it must be given to me on credit. And number two is when you sell it to me, say, please, I'm so honored that you are buying my Rafal or you're buying my P8 Poseidon. This is the kind of thing. And what that does is Indian arms acquisition takes forever. The Hawks, it took 20 years. The Rafale, it took almost 15 years. We're still waiting for the Sea Guardian deal to be signed. And this goes on. And while the Indian armed forces keep waiting, India's strategic challenges keep acquiring weapons systems and upgrading their capabilities. And what I would say is this kind of approach has to be broken. And also remember this, the Saudis and the UAE go out and throw like $50 billion to the United States in a period of six months. So in India taking 15 years to sign a $10 billion deal, people get tired. You have to learn to acquire weapons efficiently and in a timely fashion. And I think in terms of arms production, I like what the Chinese do. The Chinese do what's called the dumpling strategy. And what they will tell you is we, we've decided to make an order of 10 destroyers. So the first five destroyers, we'll make them, we'll send them out to sea. By the fifth destroyer, we have built the destroyer we want. It's got the right technology, it's got the right armaments, it's got the right configuration. So what we do is, after the fifth one goes to sea, we bring one through four back to port, and we start doing the changes to make sure that they come up to the right level. And I think India has to think the same way. Uh, you think about the Tejas. The Tejas could have been flying for the Indian Air Force in 2005, 2007. And I'll get to more of that in a second. And how can you build up numbers? The, the Russians always say this, this quantity has its own quality, has its own logic. How can you build up numbers if you take so long to acquire weapon systems? And I'll, I'll just end this section by saying this. I, I've been to Hindustan Aeronautics several times, and I've actually walked away fairly underwhelmed. The Indian government has told HAL, you need to make Tejas more quickly. HAL has never been able to make more than eight a year. If you want 80, that means it's going to take 10 years. It takes 16 to build a squadron. It means you're going to make one squadron every two years. Pakistan and China are not going to go along the, your time frame. They're going to go along their time frame. And somebody needs to sit and start thinking seriously about how to change all this. Now, let me talk about a naval force structure. And I was smiling when Vice Admiral Chauhan was talking about aircraft carriers, because this is where I dropped the bomb that makes me unpopular. Here's what I feel about aircraft carriers. They're beautiful. Uh, you know, in terms of naval architecture, they're a work of art, but they are in this, in the 21st century, they're hugely expensive and they are vulnerable against Chinese hypersonic missiles, cruise missiles, and increasingly undersea drones. Uh, what India's carrier force can be used for is much in the same way as the Chinese talk about their carrier. The Chinese say we can't use our carrier against the Americans, it'll get blown out of the ocean. But we can use it against Vietnam. Now the same thing is that, that India's aircraft carriers do have a role to play in the Western Indian Ocean. And you guys know this better than I do, so I'm not going to talk about it because it's a less contested environment. What I do think is absolutely important is more submarines, both conventional and nuclear. And this is where I think the Scorpions was a good buy, the Akulas are a good lease, and hopefully the project P-75 is again brought to a timely conclusion rather than stretched out to 2045 or whatever is there. I, this to me is the one thing which can make the life of India's opponents fairly miserable in the Indian Ocean region. Good submarines. And I will say one thing, if you want a stronger naval connection with the Japanese, maybe talk to the Japanese about the new Taigei class uh, submarine 
which is air independent propulsion, lithium batteries. It actually looks very advanced. And I'll say one thing, given Indian uh, weapons procurement plans, you can always add something to a tender. Remember when the Rafale was being selected, there were six aeroplanes. We were told it was going to be shortlisted to two. And then the government said six aeroplanes, the shortlist is six. That's not a shortlist, but India tends to be nice to the people who are nice to it. So you make a shortlist that way. I think a serious expansion of the submarine force gives the Indian Navy the punch to deal with its external competitors. That would be my argument. Why not build more at home? And we can talk about that if you like. I think you also need more maritime reconnaissance patrol aircraft. Uh, getting the Boeings from the United States was a great idea. Get more. Uh, the Sea Guardian drones. Both the Air Force and the Navy need drones, both for port security and for carrying out the large scale operations that an Indian Navy, which is a blue water Navy, talks about. Uh, underwater drones are interesting. The Russians, the Chinese, and the United States are all making UUVs, that is, underwater unmanned vehicles. And these can be used for a range of things. The Russians are the furthest ahead on this. They are talking in terms of their Poseidon, which is a nuclear capable drone, which can go hundreds of miles or kilometers and can let off a nuclear warhead to create a tsunami. As India talks about developing for the future, rather than buying everything that people bought in the Cold War, it's time to start thinking 21st century. And this, I would suggest, maybe one of the things that India can talk about too. It's uh, friends around the world. And the last thing is the status of Port Blair. And my question on the Port Blair is this one. If you are looking at the Chinese, they have more money, they're spending a lot on weapons, they have economic interdependence. India has the guns versus butter dilemma. What is one easy way to deter the Chinese? And I would suggest starting a discussion on in which way, shape, or form can you make Port Blair fully accessible to the United States? Now, I'm not using the word basing because basing is a very touchy word in South Block. But there are other words that can be used to talk about this. Okay, now, out of all this, what will the U.S. provide and what will the U.S. not provide? And the answer is most of the stuff that I've been reading about is hugely expensive. The stuff that's on India's uh, shopping list. Uh, not only is it very expensive, some of it you won't get because it's considered a strategic advantage for the US. There's also the question of technology absorption. Uh, one of the things you've got to remember about the Rafale deal was, why did India go from 126 most of which were to be manufactured domestically, the 36 aeroplanes. And the answer is when HAL showed Dassault what it could do, Dassault said, you don't have the machine tools, you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the scientifically trained personnel. To build all this up will be hugely expensive, just by the aeroplane. And the Indian government looked at the numbers and said, that makes complete sense. Uh, the second thing you can't get from the United States is submarines. The U.S. only makes nuclear submarines. American non-proliferation laws will not allow those to be given to India. The aircraft carrier technology, like the electromagnetic catapult, is out. I've talked to several people on this, and they've said two things. One, we are still ironing out the kinks. Also, it's so new it doesn't make sense for us to give up the strategic advantage. So, for example, the Japanese, as they build new aircraft carriers, are not getting the American electromagnetic catapults. And I'll add this, from a naval perspective, both the F-35s, the conventional and the marine jump jet, are horrendously expensive. They're well over $100 million, and they are hugely expensive to operate. I looked up the flight costs. The hourly flight cost for an F-35 is 33,000. The hourly flight cost for an F-16, 
is 22,000. And the US is not going to give India underwater drones. So what can be bought? We've talked about the Sea Guardian. I think as the Indian Navy expands its role as a blue water Navy, it needs landing ships. And the US will happily supply that to India. The other thing is to talk in terms of interoperable communications equipment. And you gentlemen know much more about this than I do, so I'm not going to talk about it. But for the rest of the Navy, I think the old strategy of going to the Russians, the Europeans, and possibly now the Japanese has to continue. And what I would suggest is, if you're talking in terms of naval production, it's time to talk to the Russians about underwater drones. Because think about what you guys could do with an underwater drone in the Sekarachi Harbor. I'll leave it at that. Also, I'm very curious. I'd like somebody to explain to me what happened to the Shinmaiwa US-2, which at one point in time I thought India was going to buy. And this is the Taige class, the brand new Japanese submarine, which really may be the most advanced um, submarine in the world today. Okay, uh, let me talk about air power and link it to what is India's immediate challenge. The immediate challenge for India is not Pakistan. The immediate challenge for India is Tibet, China. And if you look at what the Chinese are saying in Tibet is really interesting because what the Chinese are writing is the Indians are right. If there is another war, it will not be 1962. So you're not going to see Chinese troops storming into Tawang or, you know, overriding Indian forces in Aksai Chin or whatever. No. What they are talking about is using technology to inflict very high levels of damage. And remember, at the height of the crisis, they moved a division in. They didn't move in multiple divisions. What they instead have done is they have configured their forces where they're going to have their artillery, their missiles, and their rockets being GPS and drone guided to inflict as heavy casualties as they can on Indian positions. And in order to find all this stuff, you need a different kind of air force. You need drones which can do surveillance. You need better satellite imagery. I can go down the list on this. And also keep in mind some of the stuff the Chinese have been doing. I couldn't download the photo, but if you Google it, look for Chinese robot dogs. They are using robot dogs in Tibet because they say over rugged terrain, they have more mobility. They also have fourth, four and a half generation, fifth generation fighters coming down the line. 36 Rafals is too little. So what do you do? And let me start by saying this. This is an article written by an Indian defense analyst called Ambika Gupta, where she makes the point, do not buy the F-21. And it appeared in the March 2019 issue of uh, Geopolitics. I'm sure uh, it's there in your library. She makes several points. And I think this is important for Indian Air Force procurement and force structure. One. The Pakistanis know everything there is to be known about the aeroplane. And remember, Pakistani instru instructor pilots still train the Saudis and, more importantly, the UAE, so they get to fly the latest and the best F-16s. Two, I am not sure you will get permission to put nuclear weapons on an F-16. That would go against U.S. non-proliferation laws. And I've asked this of several Indian Air Force people, and I've never got an answer on it. On the Rafale, one of the reasons the Modi government bought it was the French said nuclear weapons, not a problem. Much in the same way as on the Mirage 2000, the French said nuclear weapons, not a problem. The only advantage, by the way, of Rafale is Rafale is better for the Indian Air Force because it's a survivable nuclear delivery system. The Mirage 2000 isn't. That was a one-way delivery system. So the Indian Air Force pilot who was flying it quite possibly would never have come back. And you know, it's something to tell the politicians and the Indian media and the general public. 
that those young men who are flying those planes are actually incredibly brave young men. So what to buy then? And I would say this, I'd say more Rafals. I'd say forget the 114 fighters, which is coming out of air headquarters. It just adds one more plane to the mix, which is very expensive. More S-400, because the S-400 gives India an air defense capability, which takes away some of the need for more fighter squadrons. And I think, you know, talk to both the Europeans and the United States about drones. Both HAL and private companies in India can build drones, which can be used both for internal security, external surveillance, and weapons delivery. And I'll, I'll end by talking about what the Air Force should get with one thing. I, I don't think this advanced combat aircraft that they're talking about, which they claim they're going to do, HAL claims is they're going to deliver in 2029, which is eight years from now. I think that's overly optimistic. What I would argue is that instead, go talk to the French and the Germans who are talking about developing a sixth generation fighter aircraft and get in on the ground floor in that. And it's a very interesting thing. What they're talking about is a fighter aircraft which works in tandem with an unmanned aircraft. And the pilot of the fighter is also directing the movements of the drone. So in terms of technologies, in terms of sixth generation warfare, you have to go where somebody will accept you and give you the technology you require. And I don't think it can happen with the Russians. Okay, now what can be bought from the United States though? UAVs I've talked about, I don't think we need to talk more about that, but a whole range of tactical drones. And just think of how things would have gone differently in Galwan if the uh, colonel there had had tactical drones and he could have seen exactly what the Chinese were doing. The other thing which I've been recommending for five years now, but it seems that nobody likes my idea, is buy the C-17 production line from India, uh, from the United States. A whole bunch of countries around the world, Qatar, Kuwait, Australia want C-17s because what they've found is if you want to do multinational operations with the Americans, the C-17 transporter is a great plane to work with. You can move a lot of things. It's also not a provocative gesture because sending fighter aircraft is one thing, sending a transport aircraft in a coalition operation is another thing. And the other thing is, even if you have fighter aircraft, they can go 500 miles into the Indian Ocean. That achieves nothing. A C-17 can go around the world. It has far more capabilities. And one more thing I would talk about is, every time I land at Mumbai airport or Delhi airport, what I see are all these abandoned Kingfisher and Jet Airways Boeings. Why not use American companies, strip them and make them into airborne early warning platforms, which can be used by both the Navy and the Air Force to provide a more affordable surveillance and reconnaissance capability. Okay, I want to end by talking about an India-US future, and then we can get to questions. Look, every time I look at the Make in India site, I just raise my eyebrows. It has 30 items on it, and they only focus on defense. If you talk to the United States, you talk to other countries around the world, why not talk about collaboration on healthcare, which the US is a world leader on, tourism, education, wellness, I can go down the list on this, automotives, so on. And I'll, I'll just give you the example of tourism. I am a frequent visitor to the city of Amsterdam because I write on Dutch soccer. Amsterdam is a city of 800,000 people. It gets 18 million tourists a year. India is a country of 1.4 billion people. It gets 10 million tourists a year. And thanks to the Indian Air Force, I've gone around India and I just walk away amazed at how wonderful the tourist experience in India can be. Jodhpur, Jaipur, 
Kazi Ranga, you can go down the list on this. Sun Temple, Konarak, you can go down the list on this. Yet 10 million people is, is just not India's potential. You're not playing to that potential. And this is very easy to build up, by the way. Okay. Second thing is obviously stronger political and technological ties. And I've talked about the technological ties. Talk to American companies and say 1.4 billion Indians think of what you could do with us and 5G. That is India's huge leverage in the global technological war. Also, I think both the United States and India need to learn from the George W. Bush administration, who essentially said, when looking at non-proliferation, you can't go with these Cold War ideas of non-proliferation. India is a good faith actor in non-proliferation, reward it. So make the exception for India, and you will always have to make the exception for India, which is, I think, what Vice Admiral Chauhan was talking about in his opening remarks. One more thing, and this, this is where Indian diplomats become important. It has to be conveyed that India is more like Turkey and not like Australia. The Turks have a very independent foreign policy, even though they're a part of NATO. They've bought S-400, they walked out of the F-35 as a result of that, and they keep pointing out, we are a major player, we have self-respect, do not talk down to us. And around the world, people have bought the Turkish argument, because the Turks have been very good diplomats, both in Central Asia and the Middle East. Australia is a different story. If the American president says to the Australians, do this, nine cases out of 10, they'll do it. Now, I'll, I'll end with two questions for you. One comes out of a personal uh, experience, and then the second one is for you to answer. And my question, I've asked this of dozens of Indian diplomats, analysts, academics, you name it. What does India want? Give me a list of things where you can say, this is what we want, and this would make us a stronger partner. And I never get the answer on this. And I call it the Eiffel Tower moment, and it's a personal experience, and I'll talk about it. When I was in graduate school many years ago, um, I was dating a young woman, and after three months, I said to her, you know, I really like you. We should get married. And she says, no, I don't want to get married. So I said, okay, that means you want to break up with me. She says, no, I didn't say I want to break up with you. So two months after that, I said, let's go to Paris for Christmas. So we went to Paris for Christmas. We went up to the top of the Eiffel Tower. We bought that cheap flat champagne the French fleece you with. And I looked at her and said, so what do you think about getting married? And she said, which woman in her right mind can turn down a proposal on the top of the Eiffel Tower? Happy ending to the story. My question to you is, what is India's Eiffel Tower moment? Because I cannot get that out of what I read. But then there's the other side to this. India needs to explicitly say, this is what we can give you. Because ultimately, I want to end with this. Uh, in advertising, my friend Nur Said, who's listening to this today, used to be a senior executive with Lintas, and he introduced me to this idea of psychography, which is how you look at things, what are your preferences, so on. And if you look at India from a global perspective, India doesn't have the love and affection in the United States that they have for Australia or Britain. And I'll give you the example, when Narendra Modi was re-elected as prime minister, it was a one minute news item on CNN. But when Harry married Meghan, and I have no idea what their social or political utility is, American television showed that for six hours. So if India's psychography is that of, it could be a trading partner, it's a market of 1.4 billion, then don't waste your time with we invented Pushpak Viman and yoga and therefore love us. Tell them we're a market of 1.4 billion. How do you want to tap into it and what do we get out of it? I think that is how you have to frame this. Thank you very much. I'll look at questions and so on and I'll uh, try and kill my share point here.
So there we go. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gupta, for that enthralling presentation, uh, which, by the way, has afforded us tremendous insights and perspective on the theme. Uh, this is a virtual program, uh, but we had a sense of a pin drop silence, which was primarily the interest and intrigue which your presentation has generated. Now, the present, uh, the the perspective and the way ahead, and the suggestion which has emanated from this presentation would now be discussed over the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes and uh, would be moderated by Admiral Chauhan. So it, it, it uh, now once again gives me a great honor <clears throat> to invite and request Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation to moderate this audience interaction. Admiral Chauhan, I yield the floor to you. You can try one more time to, uh, yes, sir. to stop share. Perhaps the stop share is Ah, done, 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 done. done. Do oh, you know, I had to click, I had to click on file. That is, that is why I didn't. Ah, um, well, that right. was the no silly. Yes. Yeah. No. It's, it's the first time I'm using it. So, and let me turn off yeah. my mic. So, so. I mean, that is probably your Eiffel Tower moment for this year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Yes. So we have already. Uh, a few questions, and I can see Commodore Gyanu Sharma, who is uh, now uh, on video. So, sir, rather than asking a question in the chat box, I presume you wish to ask it uh, over uh, over your mic. So, I'll mute my mic and give you the floor for, to make the opening salvo. With many apologies to the people who have already entered uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, um, Commodore Sharma, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, uh, if I may, uh, in the panel, we have uh, uh, very eminent uh, people and of course, uh, we have uh, people who are non aviators, but who have commanded aircraft carriers. So no better and uh, uh, kind of uh, balanced view can be culled out from their viewpoint from their personal experience. Now that said, now you mentioned about the naval force structure. And in that you said the aircraft carriers, while they are expensive and they're invulnerable, I mean they're vulnerable against Chinese hypersonic missiles and the works. But the fact of the matter is, aircraft carrier is power projection, uh, and it will perennially, it will always remain prone to such kind of uh, uh, attacks or threats, if one may say. But that notwithstanding, that does not. Uh, you know, give you uh, even a sense of imagination that uh, a Navy worth its name can operate without uh, worthwhile aircraft carriers. And uh, that said, uh, not very long ago, I think we all have seen in the media, the first indigenous aircraft carrier was put to sea just the other day or not many, couple of hours, it's about 100 odd hours ago, and uh, they carried out the successful first outing. But the fact of the matter is that, that only will bring in as the second aircraft carrier in our fleet. What one would require is the third, fourth, fifth, and the sixth carriers. May not be tomorrow, day after, and the day, day after. But the fact is that is what would be required. And uh, perhaps it may not be uh, pertinent to say that uh, this is out because uh, emails may not be. But let's not forget. I mean, when we look at aircraft submarines and the ships, we are also looking at a kind of Technology, which is just about two, two, three, five years ahead of it. Emails has just been tried out on uh, Gerald Ford, and uh, perhaps that is what Indians would like to have it on in the next aircraft carrier. So I'm a little concerned on uh, this uh, issue of aircraft carrier. I don't think if Navy can ever think of not operating in less than three to four to five aircraft carriers. Maybe we can come to the other points subsequently. Let's discuss that uh, once if, if the Admiral permits. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I told you that we'll be walking into this and Amit uh, uh, has some deft views on it. Uh, I just wanted to add one more point uh, since he, uh, since uh, Commodore Sharma has kindly, uh, you know, he's mild senior to me, but he's kindly uh, allowed me to segue into a point that I wanted to make. And that is uh, the arguments for and against aircraft carriers are emotive. And uh, it is true that uh, in some cases, people say that they are 
you know, there are vulnerabilities, but, you know, every time you send an aircraft up from the Air Force or from the Navy, there's some other guy who's got some weapons that are adequate to shoot down this aircraft. And that doesn't mean that you won't make aircraft because you because they are vulnerable. And I think it, it, in that respect, vulnerabilities of one platform against something else will always be a cat and mouse game. It depends on when you enter the war, whether you enter it as the cat or as the mouse. And I think that the Chinese mouse in this or cat in this case is somewhat um, not yet confirmed as being a cat that actually catches mice. So uh, it is also there's another much more important point, and that I think you will appreciate, and that is that you know, let's remove aircraft. Let's admit and remove them from the scene. Then how will these vessels that you put into poising in theater? How will they poise? How will they survive? What will happen? So uh, that is a debate that has been less gone into. Uh, if you do not have air power, however it is provided, at large distances, you are either going to be stuck to a very small distance away from your coast, and mind you, China is exactly there. So her inability to get out of the South China Sea is just that. Uh, despite having three carriers, she can't move because can buy a carrier you just have to have money but you know how do you get 25 years of experience pilots and all that stuff but i don't want to get stuck get you stuck on this and with the commander sharma's permission i also want to widen the discussion but not letting you completely off the hook vis-a-vis -vis aircraft carriers but not also becoming besotted by that question and so here's another one which is even more provocative <laughs> i'm afraid and that comes from uh, uh, Captain Parmar, who asks uh, in in um, he asks a particularly um, as I said provocative question, and it is true that a couple of years ago there was a rather interesting article on uh, the U.S. Air Force and its requirement, and once again it's a function of turf and you know all the nonsense which happens uh, in an in inter-service uh, rivalry, hearkening back to not only the Second World War but I think the first and well before that as well. So his question is that there is an off and on debate that yes, the US needs air power, but the US need not need an air force. So what shape and road is this debate taking? So maybe these two, but not besought. Don't get besotted on the two questions. Can, I, so can, I just, I, can I just add in the latest article is in the national interest by Robert Farley, 9th August. So you can read that and he takes into account the winding down of operations in Afghanistan and uh, the other places, strengthens that argument. So your comments, Dr. Gupta. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me start with the aircraft carrier. And, you know, here's the thing. I have to learn to speak in Twitter verse, which is 140 characters, because when you speak in a paragraph, people pick the words or phrases they want and ignore the larger thing. So let me repeat what I said. The Chinese and Vice Admiral Chohan, you just said it, recognize fully we've got aircraft carriers. We can't get out of the Pacific because the Pacific is a big ocean, but for them, it's a small lake. You know, they can be blocked in various places. My argument is, and let me repeat what I said. I said against the Chinese, it's not a good idea, but for power projection in the Indian Ocean, it's a damn good idea. Those are two very different things. Also, let me add one more thing here. If you have a British air co uh, naval commodore sitting in the embassy, you should bring him in and ask him this question and watch him squirm. You know, the British have sent QE2 to the South China Sea. How long do you think QE2 would last in the South China Sea? Because what the Chinese have, look, Chinese naval military strategy now is fight a high technology war in local conditions. So you bring your aircraft carriers, you bring your surface vessels, you bring your B-52s, we'll hammer everything with missiles. Second thing they point out is this is not between fighter jets. If you take out tanker aircraft, no American fighter is going to end up on the shores of China. It's going to be stuck in Guam or Hawaii. Uh, do not think of aircraft carriers as China-centric because, and honestly, you know, 
those of you who've been on aircraft carriers know fully well going into the South China Sea, logistically it's an issue, but most people now believe the survivability in that kind of environment is rather low for anyone, including the United States, by the way. And, uh, let, let's be very clear about this. Second thing I, is on the electromagnetic catapults. Nobody's been given it. The Italians have just got a new aircraft carrier, nothing. The Japanese were considered a very strong ally, nothing. Nobody's getting it. And if you're planning to make the third aircraft carrier with electromagnetic catapults, you're looking at 2050. It, it's just not going to happen. And remember, getting it is one thing. Mastering the technology, installing it, so on is another thing. And then ask yourself if you really want to buy those expensive aeroplanes. And will you be allowed to fly MiG-29s using American technology? Just, just a thought, you know? And so, Nobody's talking about taking away. And by the way, I have to tell you this. Um, what my mentor on all matters naval was Admiral Vice Admiral Mihir Roy. You remember who started the nuclear submarine program? But he was a uh, he was an INS Vikram. Yeah. And I asked him. I said, Admiral, why do you need an aircraft carrier? Because I've been a submarine fan since I was probably year high. And he said, Amit, look. Jawaharlal Nehru asked the same question of Lord Mountbatten, because Lord Mountbatten rec uh, recommended that India get INS Vikram, you know, HMS Hercules or whatever it was called in those days. And the story Admiral Roy says is, Mountbatten said, Nehru, you don't understand naval matters. I'll explain this in simple terms. I have an aide de camp when I was in Burma, and he got a letter from his girlfriend saying, dear John, I've decided to break up with you. And I'm going to be marrying Tony. So John wrote back and said, but I'm better looking than Tony. I'm a major. He's a you know lieutenant. What's the big deal here? And her response was, no, you don't understand. You're in Burma, but he is here. And it's the same thing with aircraft carriers. That land-based air power is there. Sea-based air power is here. It's available. Nobody's discounting that. But I honestly think what you need is a long range maritime strike aircraft. You know, the, the son of the bear. Remember when you had the Tupolev 95s, what kind of coverage you got? The Russians are coming with a new plane. It's worth talking to them. Again, conversation never impacts on anything. That's the sea power one. Uh, should I answer the air power one next? Okay, very quickly. Look. What is happening to air power? I'm, I'm going to annoy everybody here, but that's why you're academics. You know, you're allowed to say things which officers can't say. The United States Air Force, we used to have an air chief called Fogelsong. And Fogelsong said this. He said, today we are an air power. Tomorrow we will be an air and space power. In the future, we will be a space and air power. Fogelsong is spelled V-O-G-E-L-S-O-N-G. Okay, for Vogel song. It, this move is coming. This move is coming towards space based. The other huge thing that's coming is cyber. And we don't know what the future of uh, militaries is going to look like, Commodore. To, to answer your question, 20 years from now, remember the United States Air Force used to be called the Army Air Force. It became a, a separate service in 1947. And there are people, you know, you, you've quoted the article, and I have my problems with it, but we could go back to being uh, a consolidated force. Now, the havoc that would create with bureaucratic politics and turf building and so on is a different story. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, Admiral, if you want it just half, half a minute, uh, you know, this is an ongoing, it's a very interesting uh, discussion. And that said, uh, Will it be possible for you to organize an offline one-on-one uh, -on -one dialogue between me and Dr. Gupta? Yes, of course. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Gupta is always yeah, yeah, willing to do that. So let me uh, <laughs> uh, let me turn to uh, hmm. the, the sequence rather than uh, reading out. Uh, right. uh, I mean, just uh, you know, proceeding down that path. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for the questions that Dr. Gupta himself raised. Uh, 
but we'll talk about that later. And uh, I think that the next question that I would like you to uh, talk about is a more <clears throat> a grander level of question. And that is that how much weight uh, actually should one place on the quad in advancing this business of a free and open Indo-Pacific <clears throat> and uh, being the bulwark against uh, further deterioration of a rules-based order? But basically, how compatible are the three uh, are the four countries? Not necessarily how interoperable are they, but how compatible are they in terms of their values? Are their values transactional uh, or are their values enduring? Are any country's values enduring or are all countries' values transactional? So that might be an interesting thought. Okay. Uh, Uday Bhanu Singh asked this question. Hi, Uday. Good to hear from you. Um, look, two parts to this. I, I think there is a consistent idea of what a rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific should be. And the Australian writer Hugh White talks about this. He said, the Chinese accepted that order in 1972. From 1972 till the early 2000s, that order existed and it brought about peace and prosperity. You look at the huge, you know, Asia is now the largest amount of global GDP, largest percentage of global GDP. It's not Europe. Europe, as I like to say, is the world's largest open air museum. But it's the European, and look at the numbers I showed, 700 billion in China, ASEAN trade. The, where I think India has an interesting role is that more and more of the ASEAN countries are looking at the Indians to see how they resolve their disputes. And I'll give you an example. The India-Bangladesh maritime border dispute, which went to international arbitration. And the Bangladeshis say, we never thought the Indians would agree to go to arbitration. They obviously hadn't read what India did in 1965, you know, with the Pakistanis. Then we didn't think the Indians would accept the arbitration because they're bullies. But the Indians went to uh, arbitrations. The Indians said, okay, arbitration is international law. We'll go with it. Now, what has happened is the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia have taken this to the Chinese and said, if the Indians and the Bangladeshis can do this, why can't you and I? And the Filipinos tried and failed because the Chinese said, yeah, you won. Who cares? But what they're saying is, look at the Indian template. The Indians actually gave away more than they got to the Bangladeshis. So I think the idea of a rules-based order is there. And each of these countries is working its, in its own way to bring it about. And we should not minimalize it or trivialize it because other people are taking notice of it. Thank you. Uh Thank you. So uh, I, I think that they actually didn't ask that particular question, but he has one now, not being willing to be left out of the cold, out in the cold. And uh, I, I want to combine his with the question from Commodore DK Rana, uh, from Commodore RK Rana, uh, who says basically their questions are so what's the scope for joint defense production rather than being concentrating, uh, concentrated upon the West? What about our neighbors to the east, some of which you've already mentioned, assuming that east will also include Vladivostok. Uh, and uh, the second is that what would be the roadmap or a strategy to build up capability for achieving advanced aircraft, you know, drones, etc. I just want to preface this, uh, Amit, to give you some sense of what's happening in the, in the Indian industry right now. So uh, UUVs are um, a major uh, issue and there, there's a major thrust. And it is not that the Indians don't have UUVs. Uh, they do both in private industry as well. What they don't have is the same thing that all the manufacturers other than the United States of America and possibly Russia, definitely China do have. We don't have a doctrine for the construct. That means we don't know. We're not sure yet about how many do you want? What is, the, what is it that you want them for? What will industry make? That element is now being extensively worked upon. So I hope by the time we get to see you next in a few months, uh, we will have happier news to give you in UUVs. I think that, that the, uh, the rest of the question is something that I would very much like to hear your views on. What kind of roadmap or strategy, whether we go east or we go west? What should be because this PL 480 business of buy my Rafael, buy my 
patang by my lattu by this is not going to go anywhere Nobody okay I, I i would put it this way talk to the singaporeans who are good engineers talk to the south koreans who are good engineers um talk to the australians who do a lot of ship building and see what can be done there yeah? and that that is another way of expanding the quad these would be the three easy ones that I would come up with. Indonesia, no. Um, I, I could give you a one hour discussion on why Indonesia shouldn't have a military, but that's a different story. Um, no, it, it, it's, um, they're the only country I know who buy F-16s, but don't buy the weaponry to load on it. So unless you're doing a Republic Day parade, I'm not sure what the utility of the airplane is. But, you know, I think these three in the, East are important to Indian and Japan. And Japan, there is an enormous amount of goodwill for India and Japan. There's an enormous amount of goodwill for Japan in India. So why not work with them and go for the big items? Uh, say, hey, the, the Tiger class submarine, let's talk. You know, Japanese need to sell this stuff because their arms production is hugely expensive because they don't sell their stuff to anybody. So they're making 10 submarines where, let's say the French are making 100. The economy of scale isn't there. I would say talk to these four countries. And on the U UAVs and advanced aircraft, two things. Yeah, there's a lot of Indian private companies now that are working on UAVs and are doing a good job. The only question is, how quickly can you bring that stuff in? And I'll give you the example of the Turks. The Turks sold their UAVs to the Azerbaijanis who used those to obliterate uh, Armenian artillery and win that war. The Turks, their UAVs, they had a student at MIT who made them off the shelf. You know, you got the components literally said, okay, the engine is available here, the wings are available there. He put one together and showed it to the Turkish armed forces. And the Turkish armed forces took one look at it and said, this is what we need. And the rest, as they say, is history. The Iranians, who are one generation below India in terms of industrial technological capabilities, have made drones, given them to their fraternal brothers, the Houthis, who've gone and attacked the Saudis. And the Saudis have this huge American-supplied air defense system, which can't stop these ridiculously cheaply manufactured drones. So. Again, I don't think it's a question of you can't build it. It's a question of why don't you build it in a timely manner? And this is, by the way, it's not just India. The CIA wanted drones over Bosnia, as you pointed out, Admiral. So they went to the Pentagon. Pentagon said five to 10 years, uh, half a billion to a billion. And the CIA guy said, look, I need it like day after tomorrow. I don't need it 10 years from now. There'll be no Bosnian war. So somebody told him there's a guy called Ephraim Karsh, who used to manufacture drones in Israel. His company is bankrupt. So he called in Ephraim Karsh. He says, Ephraim, how much? He said, three to four million Admiral Hayden, nine to 12 months. And within a year, the CIA was flying drones in Bosnia within one year. So again, this is not some major technology. This is not Jeff Bezos making astro planes and all this stuff. This is a very basic stuff, which is out there on the, um, literally on the internet, if I may put it that way. You can buy it cheaply, but you need to have the political will to do this in a hurry and not do Songu Sastu with Hardnam too. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly you wouldn't get any argument from me on that. The bureaucratic uh, uh, in South Bloc is far more potent, I think, than anything that either China or Pakistan individually or collectively can bring to bear against us. So if I was a Chinese guy, I would strengthen the Indian bureaucracy nonstop. Uh, that would be put paid to much of India's uh, approach. But let me not get into uh, too much trouble. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize another question, which is, to do with, uh, you know, you've dished Australia quite a lot uh, in your in your assessment. Not dished, that, that's the wrong word, I, I apologize. But what I meant is you've uh, sort of indicated that the Australians aren't, they just don't have the 
uh, capacities because they don't have the population, they don't have the, the for all the reasons you've said, and yet uh, they are, uh, they've just uh, undertaken uh, talisman saber with Australia, Japan, South Korea, Canada, and they are always, you know, in a bit like uh, reaching a stage of being the eternal uh, bride, she's, uh, or bride to be, uh, everybody is sort of wooing her. And uh, from time to time, she's looking down at herself and saying, why? So do you think that India ought to be throwing its weight uh, in exercises, et cetera, of this nature? Or as Commander Sibapada Rat says, are there other partners other than the Quad? Because the, uh, you know, our, our, um, our external affairs minister has been quite clear that we are looking at India as going for a pluralistic uh, approach to um, to security constructs and for per se developmental or security. So are there other partnerships other than the Quad which could become a central pillar of India's Indo-Pacific strategy? Could that be either of these two extremes? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that not the Indo-Pacific. Look, everybody is talking Indo-Pacific now to impress Washington, D.C. And again, let me ask all of you, you saw what COVID did to Britain. And I, if you think I diss the Australians, you should see me talk about the genius who runs Britain, Boris Johnson, you know, who said, oh, COVID, it's nothing, right? And, oh, I'm anti-immigration. Two famous last words from a man who, well, I'm not going to get into this, but I, I will tell you this. He got COVID, was in the intensive care unit. And, uh, you know, I spent a part of my life in Portugal. So I can tell you this, his nurse who nursed him back to health was a Portuguese immigrant called Ludresh. So since he came out, he's taken COVID seriously and he doesn't knock immigration anymore. Now, all this British talk, we are going to send aircraft carriers to South China Sea. Let me ask the Navy people, can they sustain it? Can the French sustain it? The richest country in Europe is Germany. Leave out the Swiss because that's a banking system. But the richest country in Europe is Germany. The Germans don't talk about going to the Indo-Pacific. They're busy selling you Mercedes Benz and Audis. So who is willing to actually come? And uh, I'll say one more thing, Admiral. They, you know, the Australians talk a good talk. But my take is show me what you've achieved. And in Iraq, which was a wildly popular war for them, they lost two people. One was rolled over by a truck. The other had an accidental weapons discharge, which all the military guys know. He, we believe he committed suicide, but it was written up that way to give the widow a pension. Accidental weapons discharge. So it's wildly popular. I asked the deputy chief of the Australian army, this guy called Peter Abigail, so how many casualties before you leave Iraq? He says, if we have 10 body bags at one time, we're out. Now, you go ask any Indian military commander in Kashmir, will the Indian army walk out of Kashmir because in one incident you had 10 body bags? And I think we all know the answer to that. In Afghanistan, they had 40 people. 10 went down in a seeking helicopter. They can't take casualties. And as I always tell people around the world, the one thing about the Indians is they will fight and they will take casualties. So ultimately speaking, when you're talking quad and militarization, all these big words, which I love, by the way, ask them, will your public opinion support 500 troops being killed? Because the last time the Australians took 500 troops was Vietnam. I, I don't think anybody can take casualties. I've written on this and I'd be happy to show that to anyone. So my take is the Japanese will fight, the Indians will fight, the Vietnamese will fight. What can you do about this thing? And the United States will fight, of course. The rest yeah, of Asia is given to the Chinese. Sorry, sorry, I mean, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt. My apologies. Uh, I, I think. Okay, so uh, I, I'll uh, I'll move on to another point, which actually has some bearing on what you've been uh, saying. You know, no country actually takes its highest weapon system and puts it in the point of greatest danger just because that seems like a macho thing to do. 
uh, in Hindi, there is another word which uh, corresponds to macho and it doesn't uh, bear repetition in this uh, forum, but it isn't something that you do. So nobody takes, nobody in their right minds, no Indian and, um, senior commander in his right mind would take major Indian assets and put them in the South China Sea where there is, they are, they, where there's the maximum danger to them. The trick is how to get the Chinese to come here. Now, whether the whether the trick succeeds or, or it doesn't succeed is a separate issue, which I will be happy to uh, elaborate at length some some other time. But what I wanted to emphasize as as a as a segue into the next question is, and the next question is that, you know, uh, the the what is the possibility of India giving full access to the United States uh, at Fort Blair while continuing to espouse a, a, a philosophy of strategic autonomy. And uh, what do you think India's strategy on um, MDA will be? Uh, so I wanted to answer the second question, uh, really uh, to ask you whether you agree with me. You know, India is actually the, the lead country in this whole area for maritime domain awareness, including the United States. The United States has great competence in other parts of the ocean, but not so here. So, uh, Dr. Das, uh, I, I don't want to steal uh, Dr. Gupta's thunder, but I just wanted to emphasize the fact that this is one area that you should be very proud of India. So, Amit. Uh, the, uh, look, I'm all for a naval, an Indian forward naval policy. Uh, the first time I went to Naval Headquarters in Western Naval Command, they put up a slide where they say, our area of responsibility is to the Cape of Good Hope and the Strait of Malacca, which I think is still a pretty good area of responsibility, one where you do maritime domain awareness, so on. Nobody else in the region can do it. And honestly, nobody else in the region is trusted. I mean, you, you know this, that when the African Union had their meeting in Mozambique, Mozambique asked India to provide naval security. They didn't go to anybody else around the uh, Indian Ocean. And the Indians happily showed up, left on the day they were supposed to, handshakes everywhere. So my, my take is this kind of forward thinking is actually excellent. And it, it is the wave of the future. You know, I, I, I would put it that way. I also think as far as the Chinese are concerned, look, submarines with Brahmos or the son of Brahmos become a huge game changer. And again, I understand a submarine is not sexy because when the Honorable Narendra Bhai Modi comes for Navy Day fleet review, you can show here is INS Vikramaditya and launch some MiG 29s. But when you say, uh, INS Arigant, Mr. Prime Minister, it's down there. And nobody has that kind of imagination that you can look 30 feet underwater or 30 meters underwater. There, there is, you know, there is a reason that surface fleets get the budgets they do around the world. Let's not mix up these issues. But in terms of getting the Chinese, I'll say two things. Submarines with Brahmos can make their lives miserable. Second thing is, Port Blair is your biggest aircraft carrier. You put four squadrons of Sukhois with Brahmos there, nothing is coming out of this Strait of Malacca. I guarantee that one. Because you take down two Chinese ships, that Navy will never leave port again. So India has options. And those options are not, I, what I'm saying is, we have to start thinking, or India has to start thinking in terms of an integrated response rather than the army respond. It's like when you talk to the army about Cargill, what did the Navy uh, Air Force do? They just bombed a bunch of rocks. Good, that's, you know, Indian Bahaduri 56 inch chest got it. But in, in real terms, you have to talk integrated operations. I think that would be my main uh, takeaway on this. And I think the Indian military is well prepared to do that. No, no arguments there. So uh, let me uh, I'll turn to Rishi Atreya's uh, question about, uh, you know, any comment on non-traditional security threats to maritime security and the merchant uh, marine? 
I'm unsure uh, what exactly the last bit meant, but maybe non security, non traditional security, uh, you know, is something that you might want to uh, talk about. It's not something that is central to this discussion, but since we have a couple of minutes. Very quickly, non traditional security threats from a naval perspective. Mumbai 2008, that they came in, they killed 160 people, more, 166 people, and it took three days to wipe that out. What if India had had a real drone force which was surveilling the coast? And would have, it would have picked up bad characters. Merchant Marine, I can't talk about. That's way beyond any level of competence that even I would like to claim. But in real terms, port security matters. You know, there's 200 minor ports in India from what I remember. These are low hanging fruit for bad characters from your friendly neighbor to the West. So I, I think non-traditional is a huge issue. There's also the other one. What if somebody smuggles in a nuclear bomb? That has always been, since 9-11, this is what scared the Obama administration. Again, there are some very serious people in India who look at this stuff. I know at least one of them. Uh, I think you need to start talking more seriously about port security, container security, these kinds of things, and figure out how to do it efficiently. And this is where all these Indian companies that make drones, thank you, sell us a few. That, that would be my argument. Thank you. And uh, I have a question uh, from uh, uh, from um, Mr. Sunil Muralidhar Shastri, who doesn't trust my uh, ability to pronounce uh, French names correctly. And so I'm going to turn the the uh, mic over to him uh, and uh, ask him to uh, read out for the benefit of those who haven't read his question on the on the chat box. Over to you, Sunil. <laughs> that's 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 that's. Uh, I mean, I I would trust you to uh, speak any language, Admiral uh, Chauhan. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, very very kind of you for recognizing my question. Um, thank you, Amit. First of all, for your very pragmatic and uh, you know very very down to earth or down to see or whatever presentation. Now there was this uh, French ambassador, uh, John Jose. Uh, uh, sorry, John, John Jules Jusseran, uh, who was who said about that tells, tells you how much French I speak, uh, you know, Admiral Chauhan. So, <laughs> so he said about 100 years ago, over 100 years ago, that I mean, now I've, I've added my words to it, but the US, if you can call it the superpower, the only superpower now, uh, it has friendly neighbors or at least non predatory neighbors to the north and the south who in their wildest imagination are not going to dream even of attacking the US and they have fish to the east and west. So that means basically, and that is USA has shown us that, you know, USA has shown us throughout, you know, last hundred years that the latitude for the US to make serious errors of judgment is absolutely infinite. Now you cannot say that about any other country, even today. I just wanted to get your thoughts vis-a-vis -vis this statement, vis-a-vis -vis the current day context in terms of whatever you might look call, call them the, the current powers or the new powers or the new superpowers or whatever. So may that be China, may that be India, may that be Russia or, or the other people that you talked about in the quad, uh, namely Australia or Japan and so on. You know. So I just want to get your sort of overall thought on this situation and how USA still continues to dominate because of that very, uh, very peculiar situation they are in. Thank you so much, Sunil. Amit, it's all yours. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly on this. Uh, the real issue for the United States is not external security, it is internal inequality. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Joe Biden won, I think, 295 counties. Donald Trump won 2,600, 2,800 counties. Joe Biden got 5 million more votes than Donald Trump. He got 70% of American GDP. Trump got 29.1% of American GDP. 
And I've written an article on this, which you know is available. I'll, I'll try and find it and put it in the chat. Eight states in America will have 50% of the population. Another seven will have 25%. So what is happening is, in this country, you're seeing huge inequalities come up. And that is what the Biden administration is trying to fight with all these infrastructure bills and so on. In the long run, every democracy around the world is facing this. This is why you're getting the Viktor Orbans and people like this coming up. This is why, to use your example of the French, uh, Marine Le Pen may be the next president of France from the Front National. And by the way, just very quickly, I should point this out. Both my sister and I studied Portuguese at JNU, and the professor was a Brazilian who told my sister, you are a good student of Portuguese. Your brother was a poor student of Portuguese. So linguistic ability, that went out of the window a long time ago. But look, <laughs> this is what I would say. Europe is aging. They're going to have to put all their money into healthcare. Uh, my friend runs an NGO in Canada. He says the Canadians need 400,000 migrants a year to pay the social security bills of their elderly. Uh, th th these are the facts. These people cannot fight. With what are they going to fight? 60-year-olds. Uh, so that is EU and the Western Alliance. The, the Chinese, I don't buy this. I, I did the numbers on this. The Chinese have will have 300 million people between the age group of 15 to 34. 300 million is about the population of the United States. That's enough for industry, enough for a military, enough for intellectual innovation. Do not underestimate the Chinese. Sachin Tendulkar does not fall sick. And may I point out to all of you as Indians, Sachin Tendulkar was the greatest batsman ever. Virat Kohli is a flat track bully. So I do want to make that point very clear. The Russians, you know, the Russians, it's so sad. If you ever talk to the Russians, they are the most intelligent people on the planet. Their literature, their music, you go down the list on their scientific achievements. Mm -hmm. But they are also, they are not capitalists. You know, what they could, they could have Microsoft, they could have Google. Instead, they have computer hacking. And you ask yourself, as a computer hacker, you make $5 million. As the head of Amazon, Jeff Bezos makes $170 billion. The Russians don't think big. And everything the Russians used to export in 1981 is exactly what they export in 2021. Weapons, vodka, caviar, raw materials. That, that economy is not changing. And look, where I think India falls, to me, the danger for India is you're losing the demographic dividend. Mm. You'll, and, and I have yet to meet an Indian who doesn't say that. So mm -hmm. it's not like I'm telling you something you didn't know already. Mm -hmm. You're losing the demographic dividend. Yeah. The, world, the world's globalized economy needs different skill sets. You mm -hmm. don't get them at all these private universities that have opened up in India. Mm -hmm. Indian English now, we are the last generation of people who were trained in India who are fluent in English. You go talk to all these young people, they'll talk three sentences in English and then they switch to Hindi. They cannot have a conversation with you. And they cannot write critically. Somebody sent me a PhD from JNU and said, has it been plagiarized? So I ran it through my plagiarization software. And I said, half of it has been plagiarized, but I'm sure you will pass this one because why not? You know? <laughs> Look, there are no shortcuts to education. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where India has to put money. Because why is it that this amazingly talented country falls short? And nobody in the world can tell me that the Indians are not talented. Mm -hmm. But if you invest in this, and, and I'll just say one more, because this is one of my favorite hobby horses. The Obama administration agreed to set up 200 polytechnics with India. That was the end of it. But think what a polytechnic does. Those of you who live in Gurgaon, you've seen all those big buildings they've done. The electrician who shows up at your house with a pair of calipers and a screwdriver, he can't do the electrician's job in those buildings. Mm. He can't do the plumbing. He can't do the roof. 
you need special training. And those people, you train them in a polytechnic, within three years, they've hired five people. This is where I think India should be going. And how did India lose the textile race to Bangladesh? You know, Bangladesh is the textile capital of the world and the Bangladeshis are giving the Indians lectures. Oh, in 20 years, we will be a developed country and all this stuff. And I always tell the Bangladeshis, the Japanese used to give the same lecture to the Americans. Look who's laughing now. Mm -hmm. So a bit of humility works. But I think investing in the fundamentals, sir, is far more important than talking big stuff. You know? I'll leave it at that. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Sunil, if I could, uh, yeah, you've already muted your mic, so many thanks. Uh, and uh, there is a last question. Uh, it's a regrettable uh, feature of the of Stephen Hawkins' uh, legacy that we always have a last question because we're out of time. Uh, so, what uh, Amit, uh, I would like you to tell us is that, you know, you've mentioned that, uh, and this is from God of Datta, who says that you mentioned that Vietnam and J Japan are willing to fight as compared to the Australians. But what is your opinion on the domestic uh, public uh, opinion of Japan and the peace lobby and all that? And, uh, and, and, uh, and an ancillary question to that, of course, is, so then if India is willing to fight, then to what degree ought we to uh, accord seriousness to the uh, Prime Ministerial utterance most recently uh, repeated at the UN Security Council, where he says that India has a major role as a net security provider. And if you run into grief on the last question, I'll be happy to pitch in, but this is not my talk. So it's over to you, sir. Uh, I'm actually going to leave the last part of the question to you because this is a debate that's happening in Delhi, not in Montgomery, Alabama. You know, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, on the first part, look, there's two strains in Japan. Strain one is the peace lobby. And even today, if you go to Hiroshima, which I did a few years back, they bring in school children from all over Japan to go and look at the museum and say, this is what happened to us. So, and Hiroshima still, you, you feel the stench of death in it, even though it's been 70 odd years since the bombs were let off. I think that is part of Japan's collective psyche. Flip side is there are a lot of Japanese now who are saying, let's talk about nuclear weapons. And they've started a debate on this. And the Japanese being Japanese are very careful. They say, we're not saying we're having nuclear weapons. We're saying we've started a debate and the debate is necessary. Because as you become an older country, as the Chinese keep firing missiles over you and doing this kind of and ramming your uh, boats with their fishing vessels, you have to have some kind of deterrent capability, which goes beyond a good Navy. And what I always tell people is when the Japanese build go nuclear, it will be the Toyota nuclear bomb and the Honda nuclear missile. They'll both be zero defect and they'll be very good. It won't be like the North Koreans. I did a hundred kiloton explosion. Sorry, it was half a kiloton. That, that's a different kettle of fish. I, you may in the next 10 to 20 years see the Japanese decide that true peace and deterrence requires nuclear weapons. But it's a big may, and you need to talk to the Japanese about that. The second part I'll leave to you, Admiral. Thank you uh, once again for, uh, we haven't got enough time for me to satisfy, I'm sure Tanushri Sarkar, because she's been quite insistent on this question, uh, has repeated it twice. And so I will make a very quick shot at answering. And the answer is that, you know, when you look at India as a net security provider, you must appreciate the difference between capacity and capability. And India may not have capacities where capacity is material wherewithal. But that's because countries that have capacity throw capacity as a problem. India hasn't got as much spare capacity as it needed if it was to follow the Western model. But no one is holding a gun to our head and say, follow the Western model. So you must play to the strength cards in your hand, and those cards are capability. And therefore, 
the reason why we have Mauritius, for example, on our site squarely is not because we've provided them with X amount of material wherewithal, but because we've trained them, we've provided them with organizational infrastructure. You don't have a patrol boat, my favorite uh, question. I give you a patrol boat, I have doubled your capacity. Do you know how to operate the patrol boat? Can you, do you have a life cycle costing? Do you have a maintenance come operational cost? Do you have a legal framework? Do you have a training uh, cycle? Yes, 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 yes. Boy, you've got capability. No, 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 and no, you've only got a liability. So India seeks to maximize its cards, and it is a foolish India that would just listen to the the, the, the models being followed by other countries which might have a strong suit in capacity. We have a strong suit in capability. I agree entirely with uh, Dr. Gupta's point that we are in grave danger of, of frittering away our, our capability cards by poor education, by inadequate attention to linguistic articulation. You know, if, if you come from JNU and I have um, strong views about JNU, uh, which are not capable of being mentioned here. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you the last answer there. I know you're coming in from JNU, but as you said, this is the la these are the last of the Mohicans. What happens after this? It's not that our people aren't thinking. Our people are thinking. They just can't articulate what they're thinking. And if all you can say is "ga" and then switch over to four different languages, be be fluent in one of them. It doesn't matter whether it is English or it is Spanish or it is be fluent in that one and have your reference material in 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 that particular language. You're singing. So I think that the education piece is very, very much the center of the capability strong suit that I hope that India will know how to uh, deploy continuously. So with that, we have come to a hard stop and gone a bit over, I'm afraid. I, let me apologize I straight away, but first let me hand I over know. to Amit for two, yeah. for two fingers. For two fingers, two quick points, not two fingers. It's uh, look, one, What's laughable about JNU is everybody criticizes JNU for being leftist, and which I think is a silly argument. Do you think anybody in any village in Bihar cares about the dictatorship of the proletariat in Vasant Kunj? It's just not happening, nor in Maharashtra, nor in uh, Telangana. Okay, as I keep telling people, what you need to do with JNU is ask them this question. What work have you done in the last 10 years? Show me the books, show me the articles, show me everything, show me the PhDs, because that is what makes you an institution. Yeah, yeah you've all seen my CV, I work, you know, not claiming anything beyond that. Uh, the second one is on the English language and other languages. We have become what I like to say, the Rajiv Gandhi Baba Lo. If, if you remember Rajiv Gandhi, he could not, speak a sentence in one language. He would start in English and end in Hindi. He would start in Hindi and end in English. And, and that's what you have now. And uh, you, your point is absolutely right. If you're starting in Tamil, please finish in Tamil. And the Filipinos, the Vietnamese, the Irish, they are all taking over the call center outsourcing business now and ask yourself why. I, I will leave it at that. Thank you again. Thank you, Amit, for an absolutely fascinating uh, uh, EPL, and you have uh, just emphasized the reason why the E word stands for uh, eminent, and I have no uh, need to elaborate uh, any further, but I do have a, an apology to offer my chairman, and quickly, uh, Put my mic to mute, put my camera off, and hand over the proceedings uh, for his closing remarks across to uh, Admiral Lamba. Uh, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amit Gupta. Ladies and gentlemen, very good evening to you. You will all agree with me that we have had a fascinating talk by Dr. Gupta. I am not going to try and summarize uh, what he has said but I will make a couple of points. 
One is China is a four trillion, fourteen trillion dollar economy, and it's only growing. A lot of people have predicted that it will fall and go by the wayside. It's very unlikely to happen. The country is only going to grow. Whatever may be the dem demographics of the country in the years to come, what they have, like Dr. Gupta said, three million people between the age of 15 and 35, 300 million. So this country is here to stay, and it's going to be a global economic power with linkages worldwide with economic dependencies, including of the United States and ASEAN and Australia. We have an unresolved land border with China. Nobody's going to come to our aid. We'll have to fight this war ourselves. And we need to build capabilities to take on China on our own. And uh, the present defense budget is India adequate. I'm only hoping that the Indian economy will grow as people are predicting in the next couple of years to about seven to eight percent and hopefully you will see an increase uh, in the defense budget so that military capabilities required can be built up. There are major reforms taking place in the def higher defense organization with the appointment of the CDS, theaterization taking place. Joint operations, uh, we have the capability. We indicated in large measures what happened in the 1971 war. We fought jointly, and we have the capability of doing that today itself. South China, see the genies out of the bottle, the status quo has been changed by the Chinese and is not going back to what it was earlier. What is a forum of four like-minded countries? What, in my opinion, what the major Play which Quad provides is provides a platform to all the countries in the Indo-Pacific of like-minded of having a rule-based order. And uh, I think one of the major roles, in my opinion, which the Quad will play is that the rules which are going to be written in the future is not going to be the Chinese rules, but a rule of like-minded countries which will govern the world in the future. And we need to get more and more players on board to ensure that the rules are not written by China, whether it is for 5G or other AI or whatever it may be, or in, including the UNCLOS. We, are, we had a very interesting discussion on naval force structure and planning and the aircraft carrier. In my opinion, every platform, whether it's an infantry soldier or it's a tank, an aircraft or a ship or a submarine, has its vulnerability. And we need to have all round capabilities in, in all kinds of platform, whether it's aircraft carrier, multi-purpose destroyers, frigates, submarines, they each have their role to play. It cannot be aircraft carriers versus submarines, they cannot replace each other. A submarine has its role, an aircraft carrier has its role, and I entirely agree with Dr. Gupta, our projection in the Indian Ocean region is best performed by a carrier battle group. Okay, it's a different ball game what you can do in the South China Sea. I entirely agree with him. We need to have a sea change in the way we go about doing our procurement. But it's going to be a Herculean task to modify the defense procurement procedure and manual be more nimble and sure-footed. As far as discussion with Japan on capability development, Japan, Japanese have never sold arms overseas. They just don't know how to do business in the arms sale bracket. Uh, the only thing is a G2G format, and uh, that comes with its own set of problems in our system. But the I will stop here because we are running out of time. But the bottom line is we need to stand up for our own self, fight our own battle, concentrate on our economy, grow, 
very important point discussion we which we had in the end was our education system and how it's failing our country this is something which we need to set right that we produce the needed skill set where people are directly employable in the industry they are going in and not need to be retrained right from scratch to be able to work whether it's in the IT or other sectors we need to concentrate on economy grow utilize our, our demographic dividend and for that we need a robust and an education system which will deliver right from primary to secondary to college to postgraduate levels we have a long way to go to set our house in order but the bottom line is we need to work with like minded nations together to meet the challenge the growing challenge of china i'll stop here thank you dr gupta for an enlightening our long presentation of yours over to you satyam thank you admiral lamba for your closing remarks ladies and gentlemen we hope that you had a good learning experience today but before we leave let me thank all of you for taking the trouble and time to be with us for this webinar i want to once again place on record our sincere and heartfelt gratitude to dr amit gupta for the time trouble scholarship and effort which he has devoted for today's eminent persons lecture i have already received several messages of appreciation for dr gupta's lecture and i'm sure that the streak will continue and ladies and gentlemen there are two important announcement and i would request your indulgence in lending your attention to those uh, please grab your pen and block the following two dates in your diary on 25th of this month the nmf is hosting the third maritime workshop with the embassy of vietnam and in india um we held two workshop in 2019 and the third one was on hold due to the covid situation however we have decided to conduct it on in a, in an online mode uh, this particular month uh, now the second is which is uh, an even important event is that on 28th and 29th of october this year the indian navy's apex level brainstorming and strategic conference the indo pacific regional dialogue will be held in a virtual mode the national maritime foundation which is the knowledge partner of the indian navy will be the chief organizer of this day, of this particular event so please block these dates and uh, watch out for the notification which would be soon sent to you and uh, in the end do not forget to subscribe to our website twitter linkedin and facebook to receive updates of the nmf events and publication see you next time please take care good night and jai hind thank you thank you satyam <clears throat> just before everybody goes <clears throat> the uh, the uh, iprd 2021 will be held on online on 27 28 and 29 three days so we just extended that i forgot to tell satyam about the third day thank you very much uh, thank you uh, admiral lamba for uh, bending us your presence and uh, everybody uh, i'm sure will join me in uploading and uh, thanking uh, dr gupta um, once again i'm 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 sure you need a huge hand but i will settle with a few of them clapping like hell good night thank you so much again for the opportunity